Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to Solve for Ocean, which is a session focused on how to use technology to improve ocean health. Um, we're here today with John Delaney, Professor Emeritus of the University of Washington School of Oceanography, Arya Elfenbein, co-founder of WildType, and Steve Sherman, CEO of Biologic. Uh, I'm Barrett Anderson, many of you saw me in the last session, COO of SNS and FIRE, and a personal longtime lover of the Salish Sea, which is not only where I grew up and my homeland, but the ancestral territory of the Coast Salish people who have been taking care of the sea for a very long time. So John, I want to start with you, with you because you've been staring into the ocean for a very long time now. Spent a lot of your career thinking about the ocean, thinking about how to assess what's going on in there. And um, I think the fire, the fire community has heard from you before, specifically through your work um, building an ocean, an underwater ocean observatory. Um, but you're doing something new now, and I'm hoping that you would be willing to tell everyone about it. I'm more than happy to, to do that. I'd, I'd like to give a few uh, preliminary comments and say how, how pleased I am to have been invited back to talk about something I don't know anything about. Uh, I, why you did that, I don't know. But let's see whether there's this, uh, some bold new steps uh, as they look to me appear to be the same for you. So I would love any feedback, uh, especially critical feedback would be very valuable. I'm on, I've recently been added to the Ocean Studies Board of the National Academy of Sciences. And about two years ago, they were given the responsibility of examining how the United States would contribute to the UN's de declaration of a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. That started in 2021 and it'll go through 2030. Um, Europeans have uh, a little bit ahead of us, but uh, we put out a request to the community for ideas. We called them the equivalent of moonshots. We called them ocean shots. Thinking we would get 20 or 30, we got 110. And then the dilemma was how do we distill those down to a small number of topical cross-correlated uh, cross themes? And that's been the work of the last three or four months. That report's coming out in another week. In that report, there are six themes, and I won't go through all of them because the report is right around the corner, but one of them that I am particularly excited about is called Urban Seas. And the, there are other folks who have been thinking about urban seas for a long time, but if you think about in a global context, urban seas represent the major port cities that are on inland waters of one form or another, or or estuaries or something of that sort. And they represent intense concentrations of population. They represent the nexus of land-based transport systems connected to sea-based transport systems. So they are uh, the place where very large uh, shipping takes place. They're also places where the drainage into that interior uh, uh, sort of protective cove uh, or it really it's it's a uh, like the salish sea which you're is you're actually seeing behind me the one barrett mentioned earlier the salish sea has uh, four or five major cities on it and those cities have a profound effect on the ocean itself so if you think across the world to shanghai uh, Rotterdam, Lagos, wherever you want to think about big cities with large populations. Shanghai is about 23 million. Tokyo is about uh, 35 million. Many of these cities have huge populations, all very close to the ocean, all they don't flush their toilets simultaneously, but they might as well. And so the point is, unless we have good ways of dealing with the impact of all these people, these places are the single most devastating contribution to the global ocean anywhere on the planet in terms of space and time. That's not to diminish in any way what's going on in the world of climate change, which is profound and major. And to some extent, I would say the two overlap, but this is an urbanization concentration, so to speak, and it is that it has negative impacts environmentally, but the other side of the coin is very powerful. They are also central to not only regional 
economics, but regional uh, or global economics as well. So trade is a huge issue. So balancing the, the challenge to us is how do we manage these systems so that we optimize the trade and we minimize the degradation of the proximal environment and to some extent, since the, the, the fluids from these systems flow outward into the global ocean, the impact on the global ocean. That's the shortest synthesis I can give you right away, but <laughs> we can follow with anything else you like, Barrett. That's, but I thought no, 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 that's, that's great. So, so you, you and I were chatting uh, before the conference and you mentioned, I, like, what is it about urban, you, you just talked about urban seas as a system, which I think is really important, but there was some specific, um, there was a specific number that you gave me about the impact of urban seas on global ocean health. Do you remember what that was? No, but I sure wish I knew the number. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, what? Um, All right, scratch that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That, that, that doesn't ring a bell for me, but, but there are of order a hundred of these at least that are more than a million people. And so the consequences of these uh, the impacts of these on the global ocean is is something that has not been assessed, Huge. and to my knowledge, no one has ever made it uh, even a, a qualitative estimate. Well, John, so you, we've always, you know, in the time that we've known you at Fire, you you tend to break off um, challenges that are feel way too big for any one human to handle, and I think this is an example, right? So how do you how do you merge the entire systems of cities, major port cities? and balance that economically with ocean health is, is a problem that is going to take collaboration across a huge number of industries and spaces. Can you talk about what, what is your vision for, if this is successful, what does that look like in 10 years or 15 years? Well, there are three levels in which it can be approached. The first is, is globally. Uh, if there were some way for all of the citizens of these major cities, these major port cities, to come together and come to closure on approach an approach that would make sense, that would be a good thing. I doubt that'll happen right away. The second level would be national, and I would like to propose the idea that the United States engage in a major program, because like it or not, these port cities and their impacts on the environments represent um, infrastructure for the universe for the the United States that is absolutely crucial to its well-being in in both economically and uh, and and uh, ecologically but also these could very well be targets for some forms of aggression there are there are now mobile platforms that can move beneath the surface of the ocean uh, and are often undetectable. I'll leave that one open for a discussion later if there are people who want to pick that up. Right now, however, I think what I'd like to suggest is that the when this report is released, that the major uh, agencies of the United States, uh, and it's going to be briefed directly to what is called SOST, which is the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology, which is in the White House, and that represents most of the agencies around the United States that have some responsibility for the ocean. Obviously, NOAA, NSF, uh, Office of Naval Research, uh, BOEM, um, many different, uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, Coast Guard, all of them are interested in this issue. And it would be very nice if some way of setting funds aside for a small number of groups around the country to get together and decide, well, let's focus really intensely on two or three of these systems that are representative across the spectrum of, none of them are identical, that's for sure, across the spectrum of these features and do in-depth studies for five to 10 years. The outcome of those studies could be, we would begin to, to craft what has been in the literature lately um, and uh, has been called digital twins. Mm -hmm. Why would I suggest digital twins? Because that's been used in the aero industry, aero, uh, in the aero industry to, de divine, to uh, design uh, uh, flight platforms and, and, and even in the space program, long before it was called digital twins, NASA was using that, that approach. But the idea is to produce and, and emulate 
in a computer of virtually identical uh, capability to, to map out exactly what's happening in space and time in, in a natural system. How would you go about that? Well, it turns out, Merit, uh, Barrett, that uh, the complementary to that concept is the arrival on today. Uh, I found this out by look by working on the fiber optic cable offshore that crosses the Tetuan Fuka tectonic plate. We can get real time data uh, from that system in, in at the speed of light. There's 150 instruments offshore that are across the entire plate sending data ashore. We could do the same inshore without the fiber optic cable with fleets of underwater mobile platforms with very sophisticated sensors on them with fleets of surface platforms, sail drones and things of that sort, and fleets of mobile platforms that are aerial uh, robots. All of them could be making measurements continuously and in real time, sending the data to a, an open data hub. And then the modelers could uh, come out of wherever the lair that they all live in. I, I don't know where modelers live, but- <laughs> The dark view of modelers you have. They talk, to, they talk to one another. <laughs> in any case, this would be a, a, an unbelievably rich data set very diff, very highly variable data set because you would be looking at genomic information as well as uh, acoustic bathymetric information as well as every other thing you can imagine in measuring in the water or in the drainage system uh, that, that feeds the water. Uh, all of these things would have to come together and be slowly mapped into a digital twin and that's not gonna happen overnight. With the digital twin, however, you could begin perturbing the system without having to intervene in reality, you could look at what it would take, what would the effect be if you removed a, a dam somewhere, or what would right. the effect be? Right, you could if, model out uh, all the potential giant, changes yeah, to the system a, a giant without, forest fire without system. having yeah. to implement them. It's an incredible policy tool. I mean, it's an incredible tool for, for decision-making, I think, on a global basis. And it's, it, it's a long way away from being, uh, available for a system as complicated as I'm talking about. And the, 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 the great unknown right now, well, there are many unknowns, but the, the biggest problem that I see, and I don't understand this well enough, so I'd like your feedback, would be how do you model a system, the physics, chemistry, and biology of an entire water body like the Chesapeake Bay or Galveston Bay or the Salish Sea, and then also fold in human behavior? Right. That's, I think is the real extremely complex. Challenge. Well, so this is something that I would like to come back to. I'm going to move to Aria uh, now. Uh, I want to hear a little bit more about wild type and what he's working on. But um, the Urban Seas Initiative is something that SNS and Future and Review clearly w are very interested in. We will be continuing to track this um, and and working help however we can, John, in your in your work. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more questions for you in the Q&A, but um, if you are watching now and this is something that you wanna get involved in, please stay tuned for, for opportunities to do that or reach out directly to John um, through the platform because I'm, I know that this is something that's going to be a huge uh, lift in the coming years and something that is starting here and now at FIRE, but has many more opportunities to get involved. Um, so Aria, I want to I want to talk to you for just a moment because you're doing something rather radical, which is you are building salmon culture. Right. Um, genetically created salmon. Uh, yeah, it's not genetically created. Actually, sorry, it's just uh, no, no. That's it's, it's a great question to ask. Is, is how how does this happen? I mean, um, you know, for 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 me and um, my co-founder Justin, this this idea. Really came from a, a question of can we can we still have can we eat meat and seafood and not eat animals um, and and I think that when it, when it comes to our oceans I think that uh, this this came from a, a realization of what overfishing has done how aquaculture has not addressed all of the the problems that it it certainly sought to from the beginning. Um, 
And the future of aquaculture um, looks in many ways to, to be one uh, that might even be more energy intensive as we start to think about some of these on land systems um, uh, for, for, for aquaculture. And so, so the, the, the idea was one of just taking the cell of a fish and growing what we eat outside of the animal. Um, and not having to, you know, to grow the entire animal. And so essentially, this is this is what we do uh, in San Francisco. And if you um, are able to come visit, and, and I certainly hope that um, that that everyone here uh, can at some point, um, it really looks like a brewery. Um, when you walk in, there are steel tanks that uh, look exactly like breweries, and that this is where we grow um, the salmon cells. From there, we um, give them a plant-based scaffold. Um, meaning All right, I'm getting. Sorry to break in, but I'm yeah. getting some feedback on your microphone. I think it might be um, brushing against your shirt, maybe. Okay, sorry about that. Is is, is that better? better? Yep. Okay. Keep going. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, essentially from, from there, we, um, we, we, we grow them on a plant-based uh, scaffold, which is a structure for them to organize and mature, um, and, and that becomes the, the product. So we don't need to pull fish out of the water. We don't need to grow them in, in farms. Um, it is another way to, to create the same salmon cells that create the same salmon proteins and fats and so forth um, that you would have from wild caught fish, uh, but this is, um, this is done uh, just in the same way that, that breweries do for, for fermentation. So I know you guys have come a long way in a long, in a short time. And I'm, I know yesterday, or not yesterday, but last week, you made a, a big announcement about uh, a, a raising 100 million uh, from a, a very wide and interesting variety of, of, of backers. And I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about when you think about wild type and how wild type contributes to ocean health, what is your strategy there? You know, our, our strategy is one that um, really complements what, what exists right now. Um, we've always believed that conventional fishing um, should absolutely exist in, um, in the way, in a, in a way that uh, really has people in the industry as stewards of the oceans, um, meaning uh, we have quotas for the numbers of fish that are taken out of the water, meaning that people who uh, truly care about these things and are um, uh, adherent to, to, to these uh, kinds of quotas should be able to charge a real premium for that product because it really is a premium product. Um, you know, the same thing for, for aquaculture. I think that if there's a future where uh, people at a restaurant are able to choose between wild caught fish and farmed fish and a plant-based alternative for fish and something like wild type fish um, and really understand all of the inputs for all of those and really understand the process for all of that and have, have traceability um, to a level that we just don't see today. Um, that's a future that I think is, is much brighter than, than where we are today. And so for that reason, the, the investors um, in, in this round and, and, and previous uh, are those who are interested in this from a, a, a wide perspective, a wide variety of perspectives, some for environmental, some as incumbents in uh, the, the, the food it, um, uh, system currently, um, some for scientific um, purposes, uh, as the, a lot of, I think, the, the findings from uh, our, our approach are going to be broadly applicable to um, even the biomedical sciences, and, and uh, some from the human rights, I mean, uh, human rights and uh, those of animal rights. Uh, and so, so these, these wide range of investors, it's, it's sort of interesting how this, um, this mission encompasses so many others. Uh, and, and, and so, so that's, that's kind of, you know, the, the, the general approach I'd say around, um, how we've looked to, to investors as, as we, we, we go further to, um, towards commercialization. So we talked earlier about entrepreneurial in our opening session about entrepreneurial mindset and how entrepreneurs like yourself are so good at, at, at doing things that seem impossible. Can you tell us about one time, like what is the biggest challenge that you guys have come up against in creating this operation and how did you overcome that uh you know there, there's so many um when, when when we started it was really a case where we didn't know what we didn't know um and and more specifically 
not much has had been known about how the fundamentals of fish cell biology. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what temperatures these cells like to grow at the, the most. We didn't know what pHs, what nutrients they need. It's like, it was, you know, we, we, we had our first cells and it was like getting a, a puppy one day and then needing to figure out exactly what it wants to eat when you can't communicate with it. Um, and so this, this was a process that I would say, you know, over the course of, of years and just sort of understanding and just being fascinated by the fundamental biology of, um, of fish and fish cells that, that, that led us there. Um, you know, in a, you know in, in, in a bigger way, I'd say that nobody has grown uh, fish cells like we need to um, at any kind of a uh, scale, like like what we're doing right now, and certainly not at the, the the level we would need to have any sort of meaningful impact. Um, in fact, you know, just to have a small fraction, a tenth of of the seafood in the world, we would actually need to have all of the steel tanks in the world growing fish cells, for example. And so, so these are the types of challenges that of of, of scale, I think, that are the, the the next set. Now that we've you know really sort of been able to establish a lot of these fundamentals of, of understanding how to how to grow these fish cells. Now, I I don't think that probably the people on this call have necessarily seen photos of wild type salmon before, but it is beautiful. It looks exactly like the real thing. It looks like you're about to eat a piece of sushi. Hopefully we'll have it next year at fire at our happy hour. That would hour. be amazing. I'll try it. And, um, but I'm curious, how does, how does um, cellularly grown salmon compare to the average piece of salmon from a like health nutrition standpoint? This, is, this has been uh, a really important part of um, our focus from the beginning. So I, I'm a cardiologist. I continue working in the, in the intensive care unit um, and, and care about this product being one that is healthy and not just uh, another uh, sort of artificial offering to uh, you know, vaguely mimic what we need that, that is not actually going to be healthier. And so um, one of the healthier um, aspects of uh, fish are the types of fats uh, and specifically the polyunsaturated um, um, fats such as omega-3s, omega-6s and so forth. Um, and so these are equivalent in our um, in, in, in our uh, salmon currently. Um, when it comes to protein, that's also a, a very important part of the uh, nutritive aspects of, uh, of fish. Um, our product is still uh, on the low side uh, and that's something we're, we're working to, to improve. Um, and you know, otherwise I'd say that when we think about the uh, nutrition, what's maybe even more important than what's in it is actually what's not in it. And so by that, I mean all of the very pervasive contaminants that we've just kind you mean of you're not, you're not inject you're not injecting with mercury <laughs> we we are not injecting with mercury or arsenic or antibiotics or microplastics or any of the other things that we've just kind of come to accept uh, as part of our seafood currently um, and so I'd say that you know even more than any of those nutritional benefits of, of what it does have um, is the absence of all of these things um, and, and not having it is is something that is is, is really, uh, I'd say, radically different from, from what's currently available. So I'm curious um, to hear a little bit more about your approach to um, how this fits into the bigger overfishing problem globally. Like, can you tell us, I know, I know a lot of people on this call are familiar, familiar with overfishing, and, and, but can you tell us a little bit more about like the details of that and why what wild type is so important as an alternative. Yeah, you know, you know, overfishing is, I'd say, one one aspect, obviously, of not not just um, uh, ocean health and, and planet health. I think in the last couple of years, it's been interesting to uh, see some of the quantification around the deleterious effects of commercial fishing. Um, the article that came out last year in Nature that showed that deep sea trawling, um, essentially dragging these city sized nets across the bottom of the ocean contributed more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire aviation sector worldwide. I mean, this was astounding to, to, to learn. Um, and we'd always thought, you know, of carbon footprint from things like beef farming, but actually commercial fishing is, is uh, you know, uh, also just, uh, it, just so profoundly impactful in, in terms of um, it, its carbon footprint. 
but essentially what, what I think we're able to offer and at, at some point in, in the future is a more efficient way to produce just what we eat. And so um, by that, I mean just the, the, the blocks of salmon that uh, you'll see in a sushi restaurant or in a poke bowl or um, the fillets that uh, you're able to, to you know, sort of get today at the supermarket um, made with just the inputs it needs, just the very minimal requisite components to grow that part of the fish, as opposed to um, conventional aquaculture right now, where, for example, salmon will swim around for two years before harvest um, in a system that either, uh, you know, needs constant feeding and, um, and all of the other sort of you know, inputs currently, um, after which about 40 to 50% of each fish is, is actually discarded or, or used, you know, for, um, for, for side stream. Uh, but so th this, this ultimately will be a more efficient way to produce um, fish and other seafoods. A more efficient way. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great pun. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me a little bit more about where you are as a company. I'm curious, you know, so I, I know you guys have been working on perfecting kind of like the core product. You don't have one like hiding off camera that you can show us, do you? I don't, <laughs> um, but it is on our website and, and all of the images there are of our product. And, you know, in terms of where we are, you know, we had started our, our discussions with FDA um, uh, over two years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'll say that has been a, really, really wonderful process of learning on both sides. Um, it's been very deliberate and thoughtful and, um, you know, every, every the meeting. The first person I've ever heard describe their FDA approval process as really wonderful. I, I didn't say it was fast, um, but it but it really <laughs> was enlightening um, uh, for uh, like truly, um, and and so I I would say that there are probably um, other companies in in this space as well that are um, pretty far along in terms of regulatory approval for sale in, in the United States. And, and I think that um, it's, it's going to be soon that we'll probably start to see the very first products like, the, um, like this. And so we and, and many other uh, companies, I think are gonna be very supply constrained in the early days as this mm -hmm. um, is still a process that uh, we are working through all of the difficulties of scaling. Uh, but but I you know, imagine it will begin um, with a handful of, of restaurants. And, and I think that restaurants are a great place for um, for the launch of, of, of new products like this. It's, it's so much better for people to be speaking about this in the language of food rather than it being more like a science project. Um, right. And, and uh, you know, that I, I think that that's, that's an, an important part of um, introducing such, such, a, such a different way of creating the same fish that we're, we're used to. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's something that's, that's very soon on the horizon and um, hopefully it'll only continue from there to um, improve the accessibility in terms of supermarkets uh, and, um, and, and bringing the cost down to not just price parity, but hopefully someday soon um, below price parity so that we could have something like a bluefin tuna steak for the price of chicken. Right. But so what is your what is your cost like structure like now? Like how much does it cost you to produce a piece of fish? You know, when, when we began, if we were to have made an entire pound, it probably would have been about four or five hundred thousand dollars for a pound. Um, we've come a long way since then. Uh, and, uh, you know, today we're, we're still uh, certainly more expensive than uh, even um, premium salmon. Um, so but, but we're- dollars for a pound of fish? <laughs> um, no, we're, you know, I'd say for, for us today, um, you know, two, two pieces of salmon nigiri are on the order of about $50. Um, ah, and so much, it's- Much better. That's, a, that's like a huge cost improvement over a short period of time. Yeah, I, um, it's, and, and still, still I'd say a, a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, it clearly, clearly not nowhere near affordable yet, but um, right. I think, you know, when you watch that trajectory, it's a really key symbol of like, where did we come from and where are we going to? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears and talk to Steve for just a, just a second, but um, I think this is extremely exciting and we are really honored to be a part of your, your early journey. I know there's a lot of questions for you in the chat, so we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. Awesome, thanks. So um, Steve, 
Uh, you are the CEO of a company called Biologic, which is revolutionizing the plastic industry. Can you tell us a little bit about, I know you've been on a personal uh, tirade against the biodegradable status and the way that biodegradability is, is assigned and measured. Can you tell us a little bit about what is wrong with that process now? Sure, happy to speak a little bit about that. And, and if I could answer that question by just putting a, a little bit of a front end um, explanation on that, I think it'll help the conversation. I think most of us uh, do our best to recycle, uh, but let's face it, our waterways, our oceans, our landscapes are still filling up with plastic waste. You know, John spoke about the um, the urban ocean and that interface of the coastal, the coastal populations uh, with the waterways. And um, we know that there's about 2 billion people living within 50, million, uh, 50 kilometers of the coastline. And uh, those people living in that uh, close proximity to the ocean um, generate, uh, you know, 32 million tons of plastic waste. Um, and um, how much goes into the ocean? It's, there's different studies, but let's just frame the problem for a second with respect to the ocean. And that's about 8 to 12 million tons of plastic um, leak into the ocean a year. And so let's just use that as setting the stage for, you know, some of that, you know, that conversation. So um, there's certainly the industry certainly has different methods of um, dealing with things. Uh, recycling is certainly one of those things, um, but um, but plastic doesn't always get recycled. And in the biodegradation uh, world, you have uh, uh, regulations, certifications that are designed for technology that's 30 years old and don't really address the technologies of today. And so, so for example, to get a biodegradation certification, your um, materials have to be heated to a certain um, uh, extreme temperature of over 55 degrees Celsius and, um, over, and then ensure the biodegradation happens in 180 days. I guess that asks the question, um, what happens for things that biodegrade in 181 days or 182 days? or a year, or four years, or five years, if you're comparing um, a performance of plastic going away, in the way, going away in the ocean compared with 200 or 300 or 400 years, then um, really what we start to worry about is the accumulation. And our product, New Plastic, helps reduce that persistent pollution that happens when plastic gets um, leaked into the environment. Um, it's our uh, technology is made from plants, and uh, we make the plastic, both the new plastic product itself and the plastics that it's, that it's mixed with um, appetizing to organisms. So they eat that structure and the rest of it. It doesn't fragment into microplastics. It doesn't degrade so that it can become bioavailable to microorganisms. It actually biodegrades, meaning it makes the, uh, the material, the matrix um, accessible to the uh, microfauna. And as the microorganisms eat it, it goes away bit by bit by bit. So there's not an increase in microplastics due to fragmentation. So long, long answer to the, uh, to the question. So, I mean, I think some of what you and I talked about before is that current standards for biodegradability uh, are tied to the breakdown of plastic, but what happens is that it want, you wind up with just a ton of microplastic instead of uh, large scale plastic. And what that means is that it's still extremely harmful to ocean ecosystems, it's harmful to fish, it's harmful to... Um, so is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I think a couple of, of things to help you know, frame the conversation are that um, in, in general, the traditional bioplastics or, or biodegradable plastics use fragmentation mechanical fragmentation as a means of getting the plastic small, small enough that it's available for um, um, the microorganisms. In fact, in, to, to receive a certification for biodegradability or compostability, your, your, your uh, material has to degrade um, abiotically. It has to fragment abi abiotically or you don't get the certification. And, and so uh, that's just kind of the way that the the, the industry has been in the last 30 years because that's what the technology, the technology could only do that. There's now new technologies like new plastic that are coming on the market that use a different method for um, biodegradation. Um, we don't fragment first. Um, we actually just make the plastic itself available to the microorganisms, even at the larger you know, sizes. That way, plastic that's um, imbued with, my, uh, with new plastic whether that's at 1% or 2.5% or 5% or 20%, these plastics will go away quicker in the natural environment over time. 
And I think that's, that to me is one of the most amazing things about what you're doing is that even just a small amount of new plastic combined with traditional plastic can have the same benefits. Um, absolutely. And so um, if you think about um, looking at, from a consumer perspective, looking at products um, that you would like to purchase and you see something on the store shelf saying it, it's, it's, it's certified biodegradable, um, and it biodegrades in 180 days, or you see something that's biodegrading in 181 days, which, which product do you choose as a conscientious consumer? Maybe the one that biodegrades in 180, 180 days is, is four times the price. Um, maybe the one that biodegrades in 181 days is, um, is, is less expensive. The, the, the problem there is you don't, as a consumer, you actually don't get to make that choice. There's active legislation in places like California and other places that will sue companies for telling the truth about their products, meaning um, if they're not certified biodegradable, then um, you can't say they're biodegradable. And so the issue is, why can't you tell the truth about the product that it um, biodegrades in 181 days um, or it biodegrades in 200 days or 300 days? The, you know, biodegrading in, in, in 180 degrees, 180 days or not may be imp important for the industrial composters. But when we're talking about the planet, um, I think it's important to realize that um, reducing the accumulation is the is the main goal of, of really what we need to do. And um, testing is shown in marine environment testing via the ASTM D6691 testing that a blend with 20% new plastic and 80% normal plastics like uh, polyethylene or polypropylene. Um, ongoing tests are showing um, degradation in, in for, uh, 45 to 55% in three years. And so um, it, the, the actual marine environment isn't the same as the, the, the biodegradation testing that happens in a lab at um, extremely high temperatures um, in, in ideal conditions. In ideal conditions, we see our product biodegrading with, with traditional plastics in about a year's time frame. Um, but we don't know what that would look like it, you know, in every single environment, clearly this big wide world of ours has different levels of temperature, yeah, yeah, of different course. kinds of microorganisms, different kinds of pH, different circumstances. Um, but all we can do is look to some of these standards and, and standard testing and then tell the public about what this uh, product is able to do. So we're, you, you guys were at fire last year, mm -hmm. the last time we had fire in person. Um, tell me a little bit about what you've been working on since then. And, and how your company has changed in the interim. Like what are, what are your priorities at the moment and how can the fire community uh, yeah, that's, help you from a business perspective? No, that's a great question. And um, you know, we've, we've been able to perfect and scale the technology in our Idaho Falls uh, facility. Uh, we started off making um, plastic from um, waste streams from um, uh, potato processing facilities. We would take the waste streams and, and use that potato starch. We've since added other types of starch, corn starch, um, starts made from cassava or tapioca as well to our products. Um, but we've we've perfected that and scaled that in our Idaho Falls facility. We've also added um, facilities in, in Asia um, to be able to, uh, to provide um, products in the Asian market. Um, if you think about um, some of the uh, some of the countries that are doing the best job of recycling and 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 taking care of the environment, um, you know some of those the countries like United States or, or Germany or, or other places that are that, that this movement is very strong in, these aren't these are not countries leading to the majority of the pollution on the planet. Um, a lot of the plastics in the ocean comes from just a, a few rivers in in Southeast Asia. And so, having our product available in those um, economies and um, locales um, where, um, without relying on expensive infrastructure, without relying on some big new thing, just by um, putting small percentages of new plastic in the in, in the plastic production that's already out there you can then see a significant reduction in the accumulation of plastics in the ocean in the long term. This isn't a solution that is the perfect solution. We're not suggesting that new plastic is good for the ocean. We don't want any plastic going into the ocean. But to the extent that um, things get outside of the recycle stream, to the extent that things are, are, are in, in the ocean, we want the world to be a better place for our children and our grandchildren. And reducing the persistency of these plastics cutting down that curve of 200 to 400 years to um, one to five or 10 years, or even 20 years would be a significant um, decrease in the overall accumulation of these, um, these um, pollutants in our ocean. So we're gonna start taking questions in about five minutes, but uh, 
Steve, I want to hear a little bit more from you about, I think this, this strategy that you just mentioned is a very interesting one, which is, okay, what if we focus on the places where there's the highest level of plastics pollution uh, as our market? How did you come to that? Where did that come from? Well, um, we, we know the way that our product is most efficient, and we know that our product is something that can help, and even in small percentages. Um, if you look at typical biopolymers, they're considerably more expensive, you know, four, five, six, seven hundred percent more than, and um, they represent only about one percent of the overall plastics market. So you can talk about biopolymers and biodegradable plastics all you want. You know, congratulations, you've you know you've touched one percent of uh, of the plastic problem. Um, what we what we've been looking for is although uh, new plastic can blend with. Um, these traditional bioplastics like PBAT or PHA or some of these products you hear about, new plastic actually blends with them and enhances their biodegradation, biodegradation profiles of those plastics. But trying to make a dent on just one percent is maybe less, you know, less of the legacy that we want to leave for our children and grandchildren. I think making a dent on the ninety-nine percent is important. So um, coming up with a product that will work with the ninety-nine percent that will reduce its persistency. Um, that won't require new technology and new new equipment and new capital infrastructure to process. Just running new plastic in the, in, in in the factories that are making the plastic products today um, is it seems to be the right um, the right way to make the biggest impact. And certainly in Asia, um, where you have um, the um, uh, economies that are not. Um, well suited for massive capital infrastructure uh, implementation of, for example, recycling. The the collection, you know, we we completely support the three R's, right. and we want that to happen. But the reality is, trying to you know force cultures and and economies into something that they're just not capable of doing isn't probably the right answer. Um, in as an interim step, providing new plastic to those economies where they can start using it without a significant increase you know, to their current production and build in the safety factor so that if plastics are leaked into the environment, um, we give nature a chance to, to, to reclaim some of that material. Thank you. Ev, I'm going to turn it over to you now as our Q&A host, MC. All right. So um, our first question is from Bob and Teagarden. Um, this is for you, John Delaney. Uh, is your real-time mesh that you described like creating a holographic view of all and everything. Um, and she says maybe pattern computer could help with that. Uh, a holographic view of everything, meaning, yeah, that's, uh, it's, rather than try to clarify the question, let me just comment that one of the other goals of the decade of ocean science for sustainable development is that we completely and thoroughly map every aspect of the oceans, not just the seafloor, which is a major challenge because it's, the ocean of course is, is opaque to uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation at uh, the 100 kilometer or 100 meter level, but not to sound obviously. And many of the animals have learned how to use sound to move around and to prey on other animals. So, so the transparency throughout the ocean is a really important element. Uh, we will be working very hard to, to render the ocean more and more transparent so that we can understand this ecosystem, which supports us, spawned us actually, uh, in, in much deeper and, and more comprehensive ways. Uh, we are liable not to be able to do the entire planet in terms of a, a digital twin uh, next month, next year, next decade. But within, you know, what's coming in terms of uh, quantum computing and things of that sort is something for us to think about in terms of what do we tell younger folks to plan for in a, a nonlinear world? That's the term that was the, the, mo the opening term of this whole meeting was nonlinearity. Well, how do you how do you plan efficiently and effectively for a completely nonlinear and as Barrett brought out uh, unexpected interactions, both devastating and positive. I mean, we have those taking place as well. The, the breakthrough in genomic analysis uh, was was profound and and made a, a huge difference 
uh, back around 2007 or eight. So, so it's that transparency that is, is so important and being able to render it is, is complicated. So that's one, one reason why my colleague, Anna Salk, who's here at this meeting, and I have been thinking about focusing on the smaller portions of, of the global ocean uh, in the last year and a half. And, and, and the beauty of these urban seas is that it's not the whole problem of climate change. It's, not the, it's, it's a focused, specific location where, in fact, distributed through the communities that are part of the urban sea population, you probably have the seeds of solution. You have big universities, you have major industries, you have philanthropists who uh, have, don't actually know quite what to do with uh, their, their uh, I should say, well-earned gains. And, and uh, we have opportunities to offer them to look after the environment in a somewhat narrower sense than the global ocean and test almost everything that we would we could use shortly afterwards in the global ocean because it's proximal it doesn't cost so much to get there we can monitor it completely and we can we can uh, collect the data uh, through near low low orbit satellites as well as microwave towers and and things of that sort so working that environment is very doable in the next decade and that I think is probably the, the most important message. Back to you, Evan. Very cool, yeah. Um, so I've got a question. I'm gonna to try to bounce around so we get questions for uh, all of our speakers on the panel. Um, Greg Brando asked a question that I believe is for you, Arya. Um, speaking of efficient ways of eating, does the efficiency of your process translate into lower, oh, lower prices? So we kind of did talk about that um, work in progress. Um, here's a good one from Alex Cass. Arya, what has the reaction of the fishing industry been to your efforts? Um, yeah, quick note on that first uh, question. Uh -huh. um, it, the reason it will is and, and isn't right now is because right now we still use all pharmaceutical grade inputs. And so as those become more food grade, that's that's where the efficiency of cost reduction will, will play in. In terms of um, people from um, the various fishing industries, uh, this has been one of the most surprising things for me is every time um, I've been out on, on a boat with um, with uh, fisher people, uh, it's been incredible to see how allied so many <laughs> um, are um, for uh, a cause like ours. And, and the reason is I think these are people who grew up fishing, um, who see the dwindling populations of fish, who see the, 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 the fewer uh, return, you know, returning fish every year from, from every run, um, and, and don't feel like the oceans are, giving, are, are being given a chance to recover. Um, and, and, and that's, that's you know, what, in, in terms of like what, what we represent in, in, in our mission, that's exactly what it is. Um, and so we've actually seen a, a lot more um, support uh, than, than we had envisioned. Um, this is not a technology that will put fishing out of business. All right, thank you. Um, it looks like we've got one for you too, Steve. Uh, Mary Branscombe asks, I've seen some interesting approaches using fungi to break down plastics without generating microplastics. Um, I know that's not your approach, but maybe you could speak to kind of like what the ecosystem of, of plastic breakdown is looking like right now, if you've got some comments on that. No, that's a great question. And that's actually part of uh, the process. Uh, when, I, okay. when, I, when, I, when I mentioned that uh, we don't use mechanical fragmentation um, as a method for biodegradation, that's what this is really talking about. So what actually technically happens is that a biofilm forms on the surface of the plastic. So the plastic attracts organisms, those organisms attract other organisms. The DNA sampling that we've done of the organisms that are involved in the biodegradation process, um, where we've been able to, through DNA sampling, individuate um, over 800 organisms that participate in the process in some way. And so in those, in those hundreds of organisms, there's a fungus as well. And so the fungus participate, um, uh, uh, as well as other organisms, there's not just one um, a uh, fat, big, great superbug that goes and eats all the plastic. It's uh, nature doesn't work that way. Nature is a co-op, and so as the co-op uh, forms this biofilm on the um, on the surface of the plastic with fungus, uh, fungi, and other uh, other other microorganisms, they will then chop out this um, high calorie content, right? 
the plastic has high caloric content and the, the, the microorganisms would love to eat. To, to consume that high caloric content if they knew but how to eat it. And that's what um, New Plastic does is it trains them, um, you know, brings them to the, to the table with the starch and glycerin that's in, in the plastic and then trains them how to eat the rest of the plastic. And since they only eat it chunks at a time by breaking the chains and consuming, breaking, breaking the chains and consuming, um, and there's a biofilm encapsulating it, you don't have a release of microplastics. And so um, in a similar way that um, there are those using fungi to do that, um, that that um, that natural process, the process that happens when wood biodegrades in, in, in the forest or things biodegrade in the ocean, what we're doing is leveraging and capturing that natural process to do that. And I've got another, thank you, Steve. I've got another one that's um, kind of broad and, and um, a little bit more all encompassing and I think particularly well suited for the fire audience. So um, Robert says both wild type fish substitute and biologics plastic technology seems like a significant advance on problems I've been thinking about for a long time. I hadn't heard of these. Thank you. My question is what needs to be done to scale these up and get them out into the market in a widespread way? Both of these problems need immediate solutions. And so I think I agree. I think um, that's a super good question for um, probably everybody on this panel is like, how do we scale these things as fast as possible? What's missing? Um, what needs to change? All right. Well, why don't we start with Aria and then move? Yeah. You know, I, th I think we've we've always believed that this would eventually need to be a public-private partnership. Um, I don't think that uh, you know a company like ours buying more tanks and just sort of <laughs> installing them one by one is going to be a, a way to efficiently scale this. Um, I think it also involves just completely rethinking the the whole um, distribution system for um, for food. Um, such that we don't need to have um, seafood coming from the coasts in a, in a case like this. And so we could we could have every city with um, uh, a way to uh, to create meats and seafoods and, and maybe one day in the same way that we have bread makers in our uh, kitchens, um, even to be able to, to create these in, in, in our own homes. Um, I think that scaling needs to be sort of just reimagined in, in this other way, rather than just having, you know, going from a 10,000 liter tank to a 20,000 liter tank and, and, and so forth. Um, but there's certainly a, a lot more um, beyond um, what, what has been scaled in the fermentative uh, industries that, that we need to, 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 to reimagine in order to, to have a meaningful impact. That's interesting. It's almost like moving from thinking big picture, thinking bigger and bigger to get bigger to thinking smaller to get bigger. Yeah, exactly. Steve, what do you think? Um, I was just responding to typing to another question. So can you repeat the question? So the question was just, um, what's missing in the scaling process? You what's, know? Scaling. To help you? what's that for us? So um, I think the, one of the things that we're doing is we're helping consumers understand um, the, op the opportunities in front of them. And so we're staying away from the word biodegradation because it's so fraught with, with difficulty and there's such a lack of understanding what the term means. And so for our products, a lot of the scaling has to do with taking the message to the consumers, the industries that are entrenched in their place um, have a certain message that they're telling that's not accurate um, and, and not helpful. Um, and, and I think that we've engaged in a, in, in a, in a campaign to help uh, label the products that are made with something like new plastic that's, that's, that's more planet friendly, helping the consumers understand that there's other planet friendly, um, climate friendly options for them um, that aren't uh, a part of the typical uh, you know, standard mechanisms that are out there is, is an important part um, for us. Excellent. John, we've got about one to two minutes left. So I kind of want to ask you the same question. So we wind up with everybody hitting the, hitting the same thing here. Um, what do you see as the barriers to kind of scaling what you're talking about? So you were talking specifically about trying to take off, you know, using urban seas um, because they are kind of um, at a smaller scale and, and a better place to start. Um, are there barriers to scaling that you see for understanding the oceans? Well, of course there are, because climate change is probably the dominant uh, factor of, of the, this century and how well we manage and handle climate change is going to have a profound effect on, on all of us. However, uh, the point of I made earlier of there being the seeds of solutions embedded in the populations and the capabilities of uh, these these uh, dense populations that surround port cities, that's, that allows us to start and work very specifically on something that if, as we learn all the tools and all the capabilities, 
we can, and, and a, a wide variety of processes. I mean, this is just, we're talking all the way from uh, orcas to, uh, to viruses and how they interact within a natural system. That, that's a big deal. And, and the drainage basin on, a, on an urban sea is about three to five times the surface area of the planet that the actual urban sea itself is. So this is not a small oceanographic thing. This is a, a, a scalable, but, but uh, it's, it, it's gonna take a devoted amount of time. To some extent, what we're doing is exploring the interface between human beings and the environment that we require to support us. In fact, if you wanna just to end this in a way that's just a, a, a little unusual perhaps is uh, T.S. Eliot said, uh, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Arrive through the unknown remembered gate for the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. The source of the longest river, the voice of a hidden waterfall, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness beneath the two waves of the sea. I think what he's talking about is exploration of every aspect. I think Arya and Steve are, are exploring the aspects of that, that they can uh, shed light on. And, and it's all of us are doing something of that sort. It's no longer just trying to look at places on the seafloor that nobody's ever been. This is looking at how we interact with the environment that is so crucial to our survival. Well, thank you. I think that was, a, that was an extremely... Um eloquent and kind of poetic way to end this session. So I appreciate you bringing. It's, 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 it's the... fascinating that you refer to T.S. Eliot as poetic. I find that really gratifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, with that, <laughs> and Robert says it's been a long time since I heard T.S. With that, um, we are concluding this panel. Thank you everyone for joining us.